The 360 on Energy and Carbon, hosted by 360 Energy. 360 Energy is a North American leader in energy and carbon reduction. Recently, we have launched the 360 Carbon Excellence Program, designed to make corporate climate change actions more effective and successful. For more information, check the link in our podcast description. Welcome back, Dave and John. Good to be back. Look at that timing, John. That was fantastic, as if it was cute. That was, we did it. We did it, everyone. Good morning. Well, today we will be talking about Dave's experience at the Net Zero Conference. So, Dave, can you tell us a little bit about the Net Zero Conference you attended? Yeah, let's say that I'm delighted to do so. It was called the Net Zero Conference and Expo. It was held in Calgary October 25th through the 27th. And it was put on by the Petroleum Technology Alliance Canada, or PTAC is short form. That might sound familiar because we had Alan Fogwell, he's the chair and CEO of the organization, speaking uh, on methane and what the oil and gas industry. So they put this on. And the truth is, I wasn't sure how this was going to work out and, and what ultimately I would learn and grasp from this whole session because it was Western based and you know, pretty well based on oil and gas. But to my delight, I learned a lot. And I thought there was a lot of things that were divulged that were surprising to me. And I'll share that with you. So clearly this was a lot of people from the West and in the oil and gas industry were there, but there was also other parties, including myself. And so I, yeah, so Chuck Farmer from Ontario and, and other jurisdictions were talking about some of the experiences and things. The objective was what areas needed to be evaluated and looked at to get to net zero. And this is looking through the Alberta lens per se. So they discussed that in great detail and I'm delighted to discuss that. Just to start off with the four areas of focus. And why I'm really kind of excited about talking about this is actually, we actually discussed all four of these items in our 2021 podcast. So let me share with you the four areas. One was the idea of utilizing and producing more hydrogen in the marketplace for Alberta. The next item was CCUS and how that was an important piece for Alberta and for Canada to to utilizing that technology not only because we're very fortunate, we have the natural resources, the land that we can actually put storage into in Alberta. And then we also talked about methane capture and the area of where they asked me to speak on with a variety of other panelists is on electrification. So I think like three of those areas we covered w- with detail in, in 2021 and then the electrification we talk about frequently in our other podcasts. So that was discussed and they had a variety of people and experts from Alberta that spoke about the topic and from a variety of areas. I'll stop there and then you guys can ask questions. Okay, Dave, one of the questions is, as you pointed out, this was out West, it was an oil and gas focus. So... What was your take on the delegates that were there? Were they all ONG guys or what? John, they were primarily oil and gas folks, but they did have parties that were involved in the energy sector nationally involved in this discussion as well. So there was primarily an oil and gas sector, but the topics, and if I can convey to you what I was really pleased to hear is that the sense we got from the beginning of the session the session when I left, is that Alberta recognizes that there's a change that will be required, that a transition is required. And in fact, it's a transition they should take advantage of because if if they did and do really successfully, they will continue to lead and perhaps advance things, not only in Canada, which we've been very dependent on in the past with Alberta oil and gas sector, but they also can advance this transition from around the world. And that was the temple that was captured that there is a a big opportunity that Alberta will need to move into this transition. So, so I, you know, in the past, I think I've had the thought processes and some people outside think that Alberta is stuck, that they're not going to move and change, but I didn't hear that. I heard 
nope, we're going to get on with it. And and the other thing that was really clear is they re, they suggested it required collaboration with people around the country, right? So that was really great to hear. And that was the spirit of that discussion in that conference too. There's a lot of collaboration and a lot of positive sense of what needs to be done to the point where I had some interviews with people afterwards that they wanted to know how and what can be done in Alberta to actually help advance that. What, what could we as a company do to assist them in that transition? And that was the secondary talk, but it was a very very positive, upbeat discussion of how they've got to move on. And this is my sense too, John, you've been in Alberta. I think, Alessandro, yeah. you've been there too. They're a very entrepreneurial province. They move and they can move quickly because of their status. So I'm looking forward to see what comes based on the conference because there was a lot of positive talk. So. Can I take you back to the people who were there? Do you think that the people were there, did they represent the main ONG players in Alberta or were they, should we say, fringe players who were looking at it differently? Yeah, I would say they were predominantly, from my exposure, remember I'm not from Alberta, but I think they were predominantly from the oil and gas sector. So let me share with you, to kick off the session, uh, David Lazell and David has actually spoken our podcast and he'll be doing it again in 2023 about the importance of hydrogen and how Alberta could really advance in that area in carbon storage. And so, you know, uh, I don't know if Dave would be truly in the deep loop of oil and gas. He works with them, but so he was kind of this visionary. And then in the second panel, they had three parties. One was effectively the chief climate officer from Suncor. The next one was the executive vice president of natural gas and technologies of Sonovis. They're deep in this, in this whole oil and gas. And they had the same comments that I'm conveying to you is that, yeah, w- w- there's things that we think we need to educate the market better place of really where oil and gas fits. That's up to us, but we do need to move on and get on with things. That that was the impression I got. So I know I didn't get a sense there was a lot of like a lot of outside players, if, if I was to guess, I'd say maybe 10 or 20% were from outside oil and gas, but I thought it was primarily. Okay. So from that, you would say that the mood perhaps of this conference was reasonably representative of oil and gas in Alberta? Yes. The only caveat I would say to is that that might be people's opinions. I don't know if there was board members or CEOs. I didn't hear them speak and okay. they're, they're right. So to be fair, I recognize there can be things that people can say, but it has to be executed and that tends to be board level and CEO. So that will remain to be seen if that follows through with what was stated. I do want to bring this up because I did speak to Martha Hall of Finley. She's the chief climate officer of Suncor. And so there's this pathway, a group of six or seven oil and gas companies, primarily large ones that are figuring out the pathway for what has to happen in Canada and with these players. And now Martha is going to be retiring in the next month or so, but she was saying that it's it, the, the mood has changed. Now Alberta needs to swing into the action and that she felt the federal government was starting to really appreciate and understand what the oil and gas sector can do going forward because they have been a pretty important piece to the Canadian economy in the past. And so she felt that it was really this collaboration that needs to be done to continue that effort. So one Alberta in the next 20 or 30 years will actually still have a strong place and foothold in our economy. And the second thing is because the federal government realizes that we are rich in resources and countries are looking for our resources, whether it's mining or hydrogen or whatever that might be, that there's a real opportunity for us to capitalize on that. And so she was pretty strong saying that this the horse is out of the barn, we got to move on this and there's no going back. So it was a pretty strong statement on her opinion and the idea that the great, there's now this collaboration between the federal government and Alberta, which sometimes if you read the media here or hear different things. 
Sometimes you don't think that's true, but she was conveying that's starting to change and they're really moving that way. I'm just curious from a general North American standpoint, do you think any of these changes that are happening in the oil and gas industry in Alberta can be learned from and applied in other provinces and states? Well, so re- recognizing that they have this unique qualities behind the geology, the resources. So if we're talking about specifically the Alberta transition, I think it would be applied to other states or other countries that have sort of an oil and gas piece. I think what could be learned if what I'm conveying is actually going to happen and this collaboration is going to occur. If we do what was stated as a country and moving as a country with the oil and gas sector, I think that could be learned. There could be a lot of learnings from that. I think the technology that's going to come out from the work that this transition that will have to occur, I think that is could be learned and also quite frankly, sold the technology to other countries. So uh, in summary, I'm pretty excited that I think Canada could be a real player if we actually make sure we align and execute. And so, yes, Sandra, there, there's an opportunity for people to learn, but also for us to help other jurisdictions as they go towards net zero with technology or even possible some type of energy requirements. At this conference, you are a panelist. So can you discuss your panel and key points from your panel? Yeah, so so they had four streams, as I was saying to you, and electrification was one of those areas. And I was representing the end use customer. And the question was electrification. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What is involved? So there was a variety of people that were involved. There was a new mining that was involved. There was a technology-based player that was involved. And there was the president of the chemical industry speaking as well. There was quite a diverse panel. It's really quite interesting. But in summary, this whole electrification thing is, and when I say that, the intent is we'll probably have to double. And in some jurisdictions, triple our electrical generation slash infrastructure. And this will be daunting and challenging because of customers' cost to do this, perhaps lack of knowledge of actually knowing what to do and how to do it. And then the third thing, which we talked about in our recent podcast is on the distributed energy resources, is there the infrastructure? How is the utility infrastructure going to actually be able to accommodate this. And there was some point of view that affect some customers that if they're not set up properly or if they're inefficient now and organizations are moving towards this net zero, some organizations will be closed down because it would just be too cost prohibitive to make the improvements at the site and they'll move it to existing sites or greenfields. So that that was kind of a wake up call hearing. Well, wait a minute, if we're not successful, we're going to close. And there was examples of talking about chemical plants being closed down because they were built in the sixties and they're inefficient. And so they're moving their production to other locations. So that was real life stuff that was hitting people in the head. This is the other thing that was screaming out in this conference. And this is not a surprise to us, but the change and the requirement of modifications and speed of change that is going to happen in society will take a wartime effort. And so that means everyone, like it won't be isolated to certain people, to different, everyone's going to have to get on this to actually be successful. And even though we've been in the industry and perhaps talking about this I don't know if I can tell you at this time that the public understands it needs that type of effort. I know there's some forces that don't want this to happen for various reasons, but it was stated like many times in the panels that this is just a huge operational requirement to actually change what has to happen. And it seemed daunting, but I'm kind of a hopeful person. And and what was impressive is that because Alberta felt that, and we know they have a lot of stake in the current technology. The fact that they thought that and that they wanted to get on with it, it came out with a really hopeful thought process that we can do this. I think when you think of general population, oftentimes when it comes to crises, we react reactively rather than proactively. Like it's very easy to 
ignore climate change and ignore all of those sort of things, infrastructure builds and needs that we're going to have. Because right now we don't directly see the planning behind it. We don't see, you know, the scientific impact and all that research. So when we kind of hear organizations playing planning for these things, it is exciting to know that someone is, you know, trying to be proactive. But I do get worried that when it comes time to implement, general public is going to be very much against it because they don't see the issue. Well, they don't see the issue. And then the other thing that arises is that it's going to be costly, right? It's going to be, so who's going to pay for it? And then, yeah. you know, when I say that, it typically, it's not, people go, oh, it's the government. Well, if it's the government, actually we're paying for it because it's going to yeah. be coming over taxes or or these products are going to be more expensive. And that was the other thing that came out really loud and clear is that it was stated and felt that energy in Canada or North America has been pretty cheap and it's going to get more expensive. It has to for this infrastructure. And so what worries me, and it is reality because we all have, you know, a certain amount of income that we can make available. How comfortable will they be to accept and be able to pay for that incremental cost going forward? That's certainly a daunting challenge. So there has to be a very big education program of saying, if we don't do this, this is what's going to cost you. So people understand it. And I'm, I don't know if that's there right now. Well, I see it as almost a cycle, right? When the cost of living increases, hopefully wages increase. And then we kind of make the world go round, right? When the wages don't increase, then we see tragic things happen around the world. That's what I'm most interested in seeing. I mean, we're experiencing it right now with inflation. And I would say what, what you're describing, Lysandra, is inflation. Yeah. Right? And, and the world economies, society can fall apart if that's not controlled properly. Mm -hmm. So you've got this issue where... The inflation is happening because of everything you just said, mm -hmm. but if costs keep on increasing and people keep on increasing wages, like I'll be clear, I, we have customers now that don't want to pay more money than what they currently pay. And, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of clients that have the same situation where they're going, nope, I'm not paying anymore, but we all have internal costs. We've got employees that want to make more because they can get more. I don't want to say it's going to be a very big challenge for society to figure this out. Yeah, yeah we're in, I was going to say we're in danger of getting political here, but why not? It's a podcast. There, There is the view, and it depends which side of the political spectrum you're on. And there, there is one view, which is that the problem is not wages. It's the cost of living. You need to put the wages up because you're seeing various corporations making big money. Flip side of that, we've just heard today that Meta are going to, what? release a large chunk of their workforce. Twitter, well, that's a slightly different situation. They've halved their workforce. And there are the, should we say, the ultra-socialists that will look at this and say, well, you know, if we've got rising cost of living, but we've got corporations making increasing money, that's where the problem is we need more taxation. And then you get the free market response. If you overtax, you restrict the markets. I think it's interesting I've looked at politics and economics and energy for a long time. And I'd like to think with the experience I had, I could explain it all really simply. But I mean, I had one yesterday, somebody not in this field at all. They said to me, so what's happening with energy prices? Why have they gone up and where are they going to be in January? And I thought, how long have you got? And this guy wanted a, a simple answer to it. And it, it is difficult. And I think we have a problem in this field that we're in. If we give a simple answer, the chances are we're going to be wrong. And if we give a longer answer, people think you don't know what you're talking about. So, And, and it's also a chance that we're going to be wrong in that one too. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, just... yes. I don't know any – I don't. you'd correct me if I'm wrong on this. I don't know anybody that's successfully plotted for any period of time the track of energy prices. Yeah. You know, whenever pundits say, oh, it's going to go massively up, it goes up for a bit and then it falls off. You know, it's such a complex system, such a complex system. Anyway, it is a market. I, yeah, it is. And I, th I think it's fair enough that we have to admit that it is. I think the point is the more you know, the better informed you are, 
the more capable you are of dealing with it. And that's both as an individual and, and as a business. But bringing us back to conference, I mean, this I think, Dave, this is the first conference you've at, in, attended since the pandemic because the sort of conference circuit as such closed down. My question to you, and it's carefully worded, what's your opinion on conferences? And it's the and bit you want to take note of. What's your opinion on conferences and their impact on change? Okay, so I think you we need to be mindful of my background and where I came from versus Lysander. So let me explain that. And maybe I'm, I'm an extrovert, so I, I actually like talking and being with people. But I'd also say in the past that the, the way of doing business is actually being in front of people. So I personally loved it because I had a chance to speak with people that I would never have a chance to speak with in my life, truthfully. And I think Alberta, they're really an open, like they're very open. It doesn't matter who you are, they'll talk to you, right? It doesn't matter what position you hold. You, you can speak to anyone. They're pretty open and, and very accommodating. And certain places you go that you might have to be, there's a hierarchy structure for you have to hit before someone will talk to you. I don't find that in Alberta. And this was another comment that was made with people that I spoke with that were younger than myself, but they thought, oh, it's so great to be back and actually talking and hearing. I mean, it's fantastic technology that we can see things and, and reduce the carbon footprint. But the idea of being able to and talk to people and break into conversations into things that you have never thought of or ever heard or even considered before. And it opens your world to things that you, I just think like these podcasts, how we talked, how I'm learning so much. I found by going to these conferences, it's a very positive thing to be able to speak to people that you would not normally have a chance to meet. So I found it was a very positive response, John. Yeah, that's how you felt about it. And I get where, where you are on that. And I'm, I'm asking this question because we are recording this podcast at the time that COP27 is going on. We're going to have a separate podcast about that. So let's not stray into that too much. But the question is, do conferences like this, do they encourage change, motivate change, or are they just the, should we say, the informed talking to the informed? Do they make a difference, I suppose, is the question. It's a great question. And, and the only way you know is what actions occur after this conference. Yes. Right? So, so as, as upbeat as I am on what this meant and where this is going and how this is going to help Canada, this could be like one undertones that I, I'm not aware of that's going on in other parts of Canada that may derail this. I don't know. But, but let me put it this way. I actually think you need to create momentum. And the fact that, you know, we're even talking about this conference and that how we think, how I think this type of conference will create some momentum for this transition to occur. What remains, to, we'll, we'll see. I, I think it's a really good point, John. Will this actually manifest to something? And certainly, you know, I, as you said, we're going to talk about COP27 as we talk about COP26, what actually has transitioned since then? That's a yeah. really big question. I don't know the answer on that one. Uh, I'd like to be, again, positive and think that it is helpful, but uh, time I, I, I think as well, I, I, my view is that it's difficult to say how w will they drive change, but going back to things that we've said, if we want change, one of the things we've got to have is people understanding why we need that change and how we're going to change. And if a conference communicates that more widely, it may sow seeds that you actually won't see the result of directly as that conference. But, you know, it enhances the general knowledge. And I do wonder as well whether some people, and I've experienced this in the past, some people come along to a conference and they've got a, a mindset or a view and they're not sure whether they're right. And hearing everybody else talking about it and perhaps reinforcing that gives them the courage to perhaps be a bit more resolute within when they go back to their place of work in driving a program forward. So it, it can have that sort of impact. I think the bottom line is on conferences like this, I think to actually measure their impact is very difficult. Yeah. It is, but uh, you know, just think about this. If 
two or three years ago, would there have been a net zero conference in Alberta? No, I think the answer to that, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I can remember when we when we were out there together, you wouldn't even want to mention carbon or climate change. I think the big thing that we had when we were out there was some guys talking to us about ethical oil, about how oil from Alberta was more ethical than that from the Middle East, which yes. was a very sound, I thought was a very sound argument. And one, as should we say, as a visitor, I hadn't heard before, but the idea that you stop extracting oil or that you go to a low carbon transition, I don't think we'd have got any conversation with anybody, would we, back then? Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And so, John, that certainly was talked about the conference, about how Alberta should be seen because of our ethical behavior. And it was reinforced by a variety of speakers that Canada is, on the oil and gas side, have been not only more ethical in how they do things, but we led in some environmental practices, which in comparison to around the world. When I say that, I know our listeners, some of them might cringe thinking we're like, oh, you guys are going to just greenwash. But I actually think that when we do things right and we do things well, we should be talking about that, conveying that to the public. That was another discussion is that they felt that the oil and gas people need to make sure they do tell when we do good things to tell the marketplace. That, that That's true too. I, I do want to say this to our listeners. like We know on this podcast, the people here, we know what change is required. So we're not saying, even though we're I'm being positive about the oil and gas side, change has to occur. It's just not going to happen tomorrow. We can't, we're not going to get rid of oil and gas tomorrow. And I'm not sure, and I, Alan Red mentioned this, that, that, you know, a lot of gas and oil is used as feedstock for product. It's not used for combustion purposes. So, you know, the, it will be used for a long time. So they got to figure out how to Make this transition when they're extracting it but also not burning it if that's possible yeah i think we have to be careful here we are experiencing in the uk at the moment to coincide with cop 27 a number of extreme protests from just stop oil and it's become you know we've talked in the podcast before solutions very few solutions are binary in this area and there is this you know fossil fuels are bad end of story Yet we need them, and um, perhaps we should be supportive of oil and gas when it is making moves in the right direction. I think that's the position, uh, and but but there, you know, clearly we have to transition and move quicker than we have in the past. I think that's the point. Yes, I think it's funny, isn't it? We had this thing. People go, "Oh, I'm not sure about climate change." Now they accept climate change. Then, in general, then. It's, oh, where we are now, we need to transition. And I think the argument now is as much how, not so much how do we do it, but how quickly do we need to do it? And I'm slightly worried, and again, we'll come back to this, with the number of report, pre-COP27 reports that have come out that are saying, well, 1.5, we've blown it, we might do 2.5. And I do worry that people are then going to go, oh, well, what's the point? But that's a, that's a conversation, I think, for another time. Well, that, that does scare me, John, because there will be a cost and the question will be, okay, 2.5, well, I can't afford it, so let's just go with what we're doing. And like I, that, does, that is a concern for sure. Yeah, but what you've got to factor in, as I said, it's a conversation for another time, but I'll say something else on it. What people are, are getting confused between is the cost of doing something about avoiding 2.5 or whatever now and the cost that we will have if we hit 2.5, which is a future cost. And you know how it is. People are far more sensitive to current costs than they are future costs. Because, oh, the future may not happen or something may change, so why bother? Yeah. So I, I'll bring this up because it was, it was brought up, I won't tell you who it was brought up by, by someone in, at the conference saying, listen, you know, even if we do something now, the next 65 years, you're not going to see change. On if we do something now, you'll see no change. It's going to still be the same way. So how? How? Like why are we doing it? Like it was. It was someone's playing the the devil's yeah. advocate on this. And and actually, they did it just before our panel started. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, oh we <laughs> want that one. Anyhow, it, it, those are the things that will pop up that we need to be able to answer. Yeah, yeah. 
Because that I think that comes from the argument that, and it, it's interesting how people will take facts and use them differently. And if you take the argument that you know greenhouse gases like CO two are in the atmosphere for a hundred years, you then go, well, okay, it's up there. It's going to take a long time to happen. Yes. And it's, yeah. We'll have to crack that one because I think that needs to be addressed yeah. in the future. We have gone so far sideways. On that <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else. <laughs> All right. To end off this episode, what is your biggest takeaway for our <laughs> listeners? I would. My biggest takeaway is that Alberta really is the energy capital of Canada. It, it's a deal with fossil fuels. And my, what I got is that they understood that a transition is required and that not, not just because society needs to do it because of our well-being, but because there's a business opportunity here. And not only did I get a sense that Alberta got that, but the federal government also got that Alberta could play a big part in this country's, you know, future. And so I would, because I heard that, I thought, Wow, that is fantastic that there's a collaboration and an understanding and people in Alberta recognize it. Because of my past experience, they, they just get things done. I thought, well, if, if they're on this, then they as a province and we as a country have a great future. I'm just hopeful that actually transpires based on what I heard. So that that's what I got. I think it's, it's interesting. We, one of the things is we've kicked around our conferences worthwhile. I think the answer to them is they are. I think you choose which ones you go to and you choose how you engage with them, but they have to be an opportunity to both spread your opinions and also get your opinions informed and maybe modified. I think it's important to attend conferences and things like that with at least part of your mind open to be saying, yes, I could be receptive of a new idea or a different viewpoint. And I think if you, you look at conferences like that, perhaps they are, well, they are worthwhile. And I think Dave's point of view, I believe that the sort of video conference and everything else, it's been fantastic. It enables us to do things like this, and it's been brilliant. But what you get when a group of people get together for a couple of days, there's an awful lot of added values that you can get. And some of that, and we haven't even asked Dave about that, but some of that happens outside the formal structure of the conference. And if I could, one thing that I brought up is that I think Alberta needs to start talking, not just looking at the supply side. I think they have to start talking to clients going forward because clients will determine what they need. So that's the two sides of the coin. It shouldn't just be supply side. Customers need to be involved in the future direction. And I don't know Traditionally, if that's been done in our country, it's kind of like you just take it because you're going to use it. I think the world's changing. And then I think customers are going to have more input of what they want and what they need. And I was encouraging the supply chain to start considering that side. Understanding I'm a pretty small cog in that, but I really felt that was a pretty important piece that needs to be considered in Alberta as they go forward. And so they don't go blindly on this. Yeah, my takeaway is kind of on conferences in general. Now, I definitely have not attended as many conferences as Dave and John, but I kind of see conferences as almost as a like professional educational vacation, depending on your role in the conference. Sometimes when I found that I was uninspired or stagnant in my position of whatever industry I was in at the time, I found conferences re-inspired me and gave me yeah. the ability to kind of think outside of the the narrow lane I was in. And, you know, I do think we thrive off change. So any kind of comment or eureka moment you get when you're in those conferences almost reintroduces that excitement to you about the industry. So I think we all kind of go home with a newfound view of how to approach our careers or whatever industry you're in. Good point. Good point. It, it, and and you know, Lysandra, that did happen to me. So that was a really good. Answer. You had your eureka moment. I did. I did. So I thought it was, that's a great summary. All right. Well, thank you for your time today. It's been a Thanks pleasure. Everyone. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. 
Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching The 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts. See you next week.